up. Welcome to the first in this series of um, talks about uh, a, nu a nuclear world, uh, that we live in a nuclear era. And um, this was going to be a course, but it's now going to be a series of public lectures, and I hope that there will be an interest in having uh, something, uh, some concern and some discussion about uh, nuclear about uh, nuclear issues. It's both about weapons and nuclear power. Uh, and of course we'll talk about other relevant factors such as the alternatives that are possible uh, for, for these things. Uh, but this course, this particular lecture, I will just talk about risk in general. And there are, as I say, we're talking about nuclear energy and nuclear power and nuclear weapons but those are by no means the only um, big issues facing us in this nuclear age. We have dozens and dozens of very serious issues that we have to deal with. And for the first time, I think, in history, there is a real possibility of human extinction. So we don't get to pick which problems we're going to solve. We have to uh, address them all. Because if we say if we want to handle uh, one problem, nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, well, we don't have climate change or the acidification of the oceans that may kill us too, you know, or hunger, or if all the bees die and there's nobody pollinating our crops, there are a great number of other issues that need to be discussed. And the thing that ties them all together is risk. We're at risk in a number of serious ways. And so this particular lecture is about how we prioritize risk, how we uh, think about and decide what is risky in our lives, and how we decide what kinds of actions uh, we ought to take on various risks, especially when we have to work sort of in the dark. Now, these are big problems, and I, I want to say at the outset that I personally am grateful for the problems. Um, I, one of the big moments in my life, decisions in my life, was when I was seven years old. And I remember being in a, in a Sunday school class, and my grandmother was a teacher that day, and somebody asked her, what is heaven? And she said, well, it's a place that you go to after you die, if you've been really good and you have no problems. Everything is perfect. You just wish for something that happens. No effort, no struggle, no uh, difficulty getting in your way. Anything you want, you can have immediately with like that. And I said, actually I didn't say it. I thought it though. I will not go to such a place. That's a horrible idea. And I, you know, we need problems in order to give our lives meaning. What the only thing that's really interesting are the problems. And I feel that the challenge, and I, I know that all my peacemaking friends have the same values that we we get the meaning of our lives from finding our place in a project that is larger than ourselves, and in trying to find solutions to problems that just don't involve our own personal survival, but the survival of everybody. And so that is, I think, what ties together the kinds of concerns that we have to deal with here. Um, so I think that uh, everybody ought to be grateful for our problems if we have good ones. Of course, there are a lot of problems that uh, may not be so, so enjoyable. And the lot of humankind in the past has been to face such problems as, you know, having to pull a hoe or a plow up and down a furrow for your whole life. You know, that is the kind of problem that most of the people could expect to have very often. And uh, I think the opportunity to work on really significant things where we can make a difference is a great privilege. Uh, the universe is a system of systems. And um, let's say we have, and all of these problems form systems. So we have problems of, let's say, hunger, warfare, uh, health, uh, climate change, energy. Uh, hello, come on in. <laughs> uh, 
I'm lost in University College. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope nobody else is. But at any rate, it's good to see you here. They University. don't know where you are in the academic office. There's lots of signs, though. Even a jerk. But if you come in the main part of the building, there's no sign. Well, you can come in this end. Anyway. Okay. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we better. Maybe we better run up a sign or something. I I put up signs. Yes, sir. Not if you come in off the uh, the her host part. You can't see it if you come in that. Uh, if you yeah. come in the main part of the building, you don't know where you're going. I put up signs at all the entrances, but I can yeah, check. Yeah, the signs I found excellent. Okay. okay. All right. Apologies. Yeah, I'm going with you, so I'm going to proceed if you don't mind. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. So I was just talking about how we our world is full of, is a system of systems, and all these systems are interactive. And so it, mostly they interact in a benign way, in that if you work on any one of these problems, let's say hunger or demography or um, warfare or climate change or energy and so on. Uh, if you work on any one of them, you'll be helping to solve the others because they're all interdependent. Say if you're interested in working on agriculture, well, food is related to warfare. In fact, the most serious cause of uh, hunger is, uh, is warfare in the world today. Um, and if you're working on health, you're also working on food because uh, poor Health means the inability to produce food, and uh, the uh, or it can be the lack of food also results in poor health and so on. If you're working on climate change, if you're working on global warming, it, that uh, it, it affects your ability to farm and so on. So any one of these addressing any one of these problems normally uh, helps uh, solve some of the others, uh, which is a blessing. Um, and uh, I know that, uh, I was just reading Joseph Stiglitz, who was saying that the um, economic problem is very much involved with global warming. That if we would actually spend the money to do the things we need to do to solve global warming, this would actually help for the economic crisis right now. So the, in general, uh, working in a system helps to solve all the other problems that are related to it. But sometimes there are actually trade-offs so that Certain risks you can reduce only by increasing the risk in other domains. Um, and it's kind of hard to work out, you know, then what is the, the real payoff? What is the right decision to make? Say, fish. If you uh, eat certain pollutants like mercury in your fish, it makes you sick, but you don't know how much of it you can eat. And you do, do know or should know that omega-3 is really necessary for your health. So if you don't get enough omega-3, you're in trouble that way. So you can't, you have to, which is more important. And they say apparently no omega-3 is more important. That you should forget about the mercury and eat it because of the omega-3. But then you have to weigh that about overfishing. And how much fishing, what kind of fish should we be doing? Obviously, there are problems. All of these are connected in ways that you get trade-offs. Uh, maybe we should shift to a less endangered or fish population, some kind of tilapia. Is that a new thing that's not as scarce as salmon? Or farm uh, fish. There are problems, I understand, with farmed fish. All kinds of diseases get in there. And, um, well, I think that the solution is to cure those problems rather than to go without eating fish. But, you know, we have to work these things out. So I'm not certain that there's a clear, correct answer at any point in time, or that you can figure out whether. Probably there is a correct answer, a better answer and a worse answer, but you may not be able to figure it out. Take shale gas. I mean, turns out that shale gas, now we have an abundance of a new fossil fuel. And it's about 50% better than the main fossil fuels we've been using, at least petroleum. Uh, well, that helps uh, reduce uh, the emissions from greenhouse gas. But of course, then now you have to worry about fracking. Uh, and nobody really, as far as I can tell, we don't have the answer yet about how serious a problem fracking is. So it's a tra trade-off, and we don't know the values of these various variables. Um, there are sometimes advantages 
to uh, some of the risks that we want to take. Um, and so we sometimes have to do a cost-benefit analysis. Um, even Canada will benefit in some ways from global warming. There's, there, it'll be possible to farm in places that we can't farm now. And there will be shipping lines through the Arctic, which um, certainly people are looking at that as if it's, it's, it's a great gift and heaven sent prize. Um, I don't think that's what it is, but you know, it's just complicated business. That's what I'm pointing to. Now, um, the equation, there is no real equation for estimating risk, but be, it would go something like this. The risk is the probability of a particular kind of outcome times the seriousness of that outcome. Um, well, um, that would be a reasonable thing, but the, what that means then is that a low probability, a, a high probability um, problem that has low danger, it's not very serious, weighs just as much as a low probability experience that has very catastrophic results. Um, I, I don't think that's the way we really think about it though, and probably I don't know if it is the way we should think about it. We have uh, uh, mostly we just don't know what all the facts are. For example, the main problem about nuclear weapons comes from a handful of countries, mostly the permanent five, and um, they own nuclear weapons and they want to kind of ignore their nuclear weapons and have us worry about some of the other upcoming countries, Iran, North Korea, Israel, they don't even want to talk about Israel, but uh, Pakistan and uh, India. Um, and yeah, that's uh, appropriate because it is the, uh, especially the U.S. now, that is, uh, well, Russia too, but the U.S. Uh, is a big obstacle. Um, but there really are questions that we are not being told about because it um, is not, uh, well, I don't know why, but at any rate, how many people actually know that if uh, Pakistan and India were to get into a nuclear war, that it would cause a billion deaths. Not that there are billion deaths who would actually be killed by the bombs, but because the fires in, uh, started by these weapons would create darkness globally, and um, it would mean that crops couldn't grow, and an estimated one billion people or so especially in the northern hemisphere, would start. Well, we have to think about some of these things that we're not given enough information about, or that probably the people making the decisions themselves are not taking into account. Civilization is a process of increasing complexity. And when civilizations collapse, the complexity is reduced. There's less energy to use, the technology becomes simpler. There's less consumption, less to eat, less travel. People die sooner. Uh, now, there are two contrasting approaches to the risks that civilization now confronts. There are both individual and group tendencies, either to embrace risk or the opposite extreme, to deny the seriousness of the problem. Both of these approaches are harmful to society. I want to distinguish denialists from what I'll call doomsday survivalists. Um, denialists are the ones, of course, who pretend that the problem doesn't exist. It's the ostrich in the sand kind of phenomenon. Um, the, they don't think there's any problem, so they minimize the risk. The survivalists are pessimists. They basically are hopeless. And they don't think that humankind has any future, but I, I will deal with the uh, survivalists first. The anti, I'll call them anti-technology survivalists, do believe in danger for sure. They probably exaggerate it. In fact, they, that by my definition, is 
an exaggeration of it, believing that it's overwhelming and that we in modern society are doomed. And uh, the only thing to do is try to escape from modern technological problems by greatly reducing our consumption, by simplifying, by retreating to the wilderness where nobody can find our stash of canned food, and learning to farm with hoes instead of tractors, etc. Um, that's kind of a moral temptation from my point of view, to try to survive by abdicating responsibility for solving the complex problems of modern urban society that um, involve all of us. And I want to find solutions that will work for everybody and not just for the few survivalists who manage to find a hut in the forest. Um, it is true that more complex systems do make more of us vulnerable. Uh, what engineers try to do is build in redundancies into a system so that if one thing doesn't work, there's a backup that will take care of the problem. But there should be another backup and another redundancy, et cetera. A lot of things to take care of all the possibilities that might go wrong. But of course, if they all fail, if the uh, crash uh, can be a very severe one. What is needed is not less complexity, but a greater independence of parts, less tight coupling. Coupling is when two things are connected so they can't be turned off, or the failed parts can't be isolated, and there's no other way to keep the uh, production going um, smoothly. So we need to reduce the tightness of coupling. The Three Mile Island had four independent failures. All of them were small, but and none of them had been foreseeable by the operators. They couldn't have known about them all, but because one after another after another, all four of them failed, the system caused the accident. It wasn't operator failure. It wasn't anything anybody could have done anything about in their situation at all. It was that it was, it was linked in such a way that it, the system uh, created the problem. Coupling, another example of coupling involves the electric grid. Um, if you, as we remember, what, five, ten years ago, took down the whole East Coast. Um, having separate localized sources of energy that are independent from the others, not coupled, would be safer. And to, I understand we're well, all at risk of cyber war, too. That is, the internet. The internet, as I understand it, is not a linear thing, but you, you can bounce around in various ways. So there are paths around obstacles. But there is, there are ways in which it can be vulnerable. And I'm, here I'm the last person in the world to talk about this, but because I don't know. But there, there is the possibility of cyber war being a, a deliberate effort to get into somebody else's um, uh, internet system and uh, bring it down. And then, of course, we'd be in big trouble. I think even your your bank account. I mean, how would you know? How would the bank know? Etc. Um, other examples are airplanes that can carry viruses around the world in, as in no time, much faster than we can even detect them. Um, and certainly faster than vaccines can be made that will uh, cure them. So the possibility of, a of epidemics is still with us. I don't think the solution is to go back to give up airplanes and go back to horses, but to go through the system and do better with the detection and with the vaccination and with the processes of isolating uh, infected people and, and so on. So we need to work on the system uh, to make it more resilient. Um, we can make our economies more resilient by increasing the ability to produce essential goods and services locally instead of depending completely on distant uh, producers for our day-to-day -day survival as we do today. 
We can't return to the Weber to simpler technology because there are just too many of us. At least I wouldn't want to do that because it would mean most people would die and I'm not ready to write off most of humanity. Hunting and gathering, some people would like to return to that. Well, there are not enough berries and not enough deer out there for all of us. Uh, most of us are going to die if that is what we do. The survivalists have accepted that idea and want to try to live on their own using the technology that might be available to them if the rest of the society died off. Now, there is a strain of anti-technology uh, orientation in mainstream society. We're not all survivalists just because we're skeptical about uh, the benefits and disadvantages of technology. Um, I wouldn't call it all at all a survivalism, but uh, yesterday, I went to a lecture by Kelly Gottlieb at the faculty club to the um, retired academics, um, the other organization that, that old folks get together and listen to each other. And uh, Kelly Gottlieb is a great uh, leader in, uh, he's been one of the main computer people since the beginning of computer age. And um, the thing that impressed me was that in the question and answer period, it seems as if all of these white-haired retired academics were very skeptical about computers. They were worried about things like the fact that their grandchildren don't know how to do handwriting very well because they use it. <laughs> and they don't like computer games, so they think that we're telling you know, children to kill each other. And uh, and so on. Oh, this uh, Facebook thing, I don't, know, I don't know about that. That's pretty dangerous, and uh, so on. So it looked uh, it looked as if they were really kind of apprehensive about technology in general and computers in particular. But maybe it may be that they've actually watched as I did, my twelve year old grandson riveted to a group game that a number of people were playing, and that was the reason his parents got it for him. It was rated for 17 and up. He was much younger, but to be part of a network, and he's rather an isolated kid in his personality, riveted on the chase and killing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And hours and hours and hours. I, I, I had the same And it's frightening to see yes. this. What is this doing to shape the Well, Kelly got there and said, you know, you just say, well, you can do it an hour, and that's enough. Turn it off, you know. Your parents, have but the be issue be there was social interconnectedness. This is the price of it. And I understood their argument. Okay, but you will get more <laughs> Yeah, that was my, my other grandson's view. They said by the time they were 16, they yeah. had it with that kind of stuff. Right. I hope you're right, Mark. I think so. I mean, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. Okay, now about this business of risk being the same if you're talking about a high probability event that has minor effects, the same as if you're talking about a low probability event with very high serious effects, highly serious. I, you know, this is really a problem because there's a, a very improbable but conceivable risk of humankind being extinguished. And that is an infinite problem, you know? There, it's not like you can give a, 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 a number to that, how, how acceptable is that? That is an infinite risk. And however small the probability is, we have to work on it very hard to prevent it. You don't get another chance once you've wiped out humankind. And we are talking about nuclear issues in this lecture series. So that is the kind of thing we're dealing with. We do not get a chance to put that off and, uh, and tackle, let's say, climate change instead. It can't be ex instead, it has to be both. Now, turning then from survivalism, the um, overestimation of the risk of technology, to denialism, which is the underappreciation of the risks. We have a whole category of people who tend to do this. Um, I don't even, it'd be interesting to know if they're the same people. I don't think I've, I've read that. There are people, Holocaust deniers. There are AIDS deniers who believe that uh, HIV doesn't cause AIDS. 
There are people, certainly people, who don't see guns as problematic. Uh, they think that guns do more to protect you than to injure your chances. Uh, there are people denying climate change, and of course there are lots of people denying nuclear risk, both the risk of nuclear energy and uh, of nuclear weapons. All kinds of people may be denialists. I don't know whether they're the same people. It'd be interesting to see whether the same kind of people are all of these, or a correlation or not. But in many cases, these uh, they they hold these deny denials for reasons of their own interests. I'm I'm not a Marxist, and therefore the whole tradition of trying to explain everybody's motivation in terms of their material interests. I I don't believe that at all. But for some people, that's probably true. And uh, uh, if you're the owner of a gun shop, uh, probably you have sufficient material interest, or maybe you wouldn't gone into the gun business if you hadn't already been convinced that guns are really not dangerous. And if you were a scientist working in nuclear energy, uh, maybe you have an interest in uh, believing that it's safe. I don't know. I, I don't. I, I think it's a. Uh, it's a risky thing to um, to claim uh, about another person. It's not a, a nice thing to do to impute motives to other people. Anyway, denialism certainly exists, and it is an effort to ex convince oneself and convince others that a particular negative phenomenon is illusory through the employment. I'm quoting somebody here. I don't know where this quotation came from, but. The employment of rhetorical tactics to give the appearance of argument or legitimate debate when, in actuality, there is none. Well, I heard Mayor Bloomberg the other day say on TV that if you are, if you own a gun in your house, you are 22 times more likely to use it to kill a family member or a friend than an intruder trying to burgle you. Uh, 22 times. Well, if you're a denier, you just don't believe that. Or you will see, well, maybe it applies to other people, but it doesn't apply to me. Uh, you don't think that statistics are relevant in your case, and, and since you're, you're not intending to do such a thing. Okay. It's like 90% of professors believe that they are better than average teachers. <laughs> Most of us think that we're better than average drivers, right? And we don't even live in Lake Wobegon, you know, where the, all the girls are, uh, all the children are above average. <laughs> Did you ever listen to this guy? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, denying operates by employing one or more of the following four tactics in order to maintain the appearance of legitimate controversy. One is conspiracy theories, dismissing the data or observation by suggesting opponents are involved in a conspiracy to suppress the truth. Uh, cherry picking, selecting an anomalous critical paper supporting their ideas, or using outdated, flawed, or discredited papers in order to make their opponents look as though they base their ideas on weak research. False experts, paying an expert in the field or another field to lend supporting evidence or credibility. Moving the goalpost, uh, dismissing evidence presented in response to a specific claim by continually demanding some other often unfulfillable piece of evidence. What comes to mind in this connection is Obama's birth certificate. No matter how many birth certificates he shows them, <laughs> this one's not genuine. You have to get a real one. <laughs> okay. Well, um, there is there is a a perfectly legitimate role for people to be careful and and, and critical. Uh, it's called skepticism. You know, science is uh, depending on people to be skeptical about each other and make sure that. The evidence is, is, is well presented and, and accurate. 
Um, but that's, uh, denialism is a lot worse than skepticism. Um, denialism, in the sense I'm using it here, is a Freudian notion involving, you know, the notion of denial as a refusal to accept a painful or humiliating truth. Uh, we apply it in cases where the unpleasant truth is so obviously true that the denier must be driven by perversity, malice, or willful blindness. This is a hard charge to lay against anybody. Probably if there were a real denier in this room, I would be more cautious about what I'm saying because it would be insulting. And, that would be, um, and so it's kind of a, a message that we should be careful about calling people deniers, even if I'm in our heart of hearts we think they may be, because it's a very serious uh, charge. Um, a basic human tendency is that we have difficulty imagining a future that's drastically different from the present. As there's a guy named Robert Gifford out in BC, and he has written, we block out complex problems that lack simple solutions. We di dislike delayed benefits and so are reluctant to sacrifice today for future gains. And we find it harder to confront problems that creep on up on us than emergencies that hit quickly. Meaning I guess you'd rather have a car accident and get wiped out instantly than that die of cancer. Is that what he's and I'm not sure what that means. Harder can do it say with Hurricane Sandy much better than global warming. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, well, but on the other hand, it's true that some risks can have value. Warfare, for a lot of people, is an adventure, at least until the soldier arrives in the battlefield and finds out what it's all about. Before he goes, he has been told that it's noble, brave, that he will gain valor by participating. Well, we, we some people encourage that attitude. After all, somebody had to stand in the entrance of the cave and be ready to fight off the saber-toothed tiger. So it was useful to have some guys who were prepared to take risks. Today, D miners are sort of in that category. They're very useful people. I'm glad it's their job, not mine. I couldn't do it. Uh, you know, this thing, I have this imagination of the farmer going to I, my grandfather actually. He had a horse though. He plowed this field back and forth all his life, back and forth and back and forth, walking up and down with this plowing. It was not risky. Um, I don't know which I would rather be, the farmer who has to go back and forth up and down the plow all, all, all his life, or a big game hunter who had to go out and kill the mastodon. Uh, at least there's more excitement mm -hmm. out hunting animals than, uh, than farming. Um, and some people have always seen war as that way. We have glorification and everything from the Iliad on. A war enabling young men to test themselves, to develop their character, to overcome their fear, and so on. It is it is um, a rite of passage for some people, and uh, something that they never forget, and the camaraderie that they feel in the foxholes and so on. Also, in breaking up a habit or a pattern of stability, sometimes there, there is opportunity. People, a risk means that your routines aren't going to work anymore. There's, this isn't true. There's something about a Chinese, there's a legend about a Chinese word for crisis being the same as for opportunity or something like that. I understand it's not really true. But anyway, it's a good story. And I think, you know, many of our democratic institutions today aren't working very well. But there's no point in trying to invent a new constitution now because nobody is going to go for it. Not until there's a real crisis where things really break down and you see completely collapse. And if there is a, that kind of event, 
then there will be an opportunity for some new system to be proposed that might, might be attempted. And the same with changes in the basic economy. If capitalism truly collapses, then we probably will invent some new system or new adaptation. But until then, I don't think it's very likely. So sometimes risk is beneficial. But most risks, I think we can say, are negative. As a matter of fact, if we didn't mean that, we, we'd call it an opportunity and not a risk. Um, and um, I think most, most risks are clearly negative. Individual psychology is involved in the way we perceive risk and address it. Probably Genghis or Genghis Khan was a thrill seeker. Uh, and as I understand it, if you look at it on a per capita basis in world history, he was the champion. He actually killed more people per capita than Hitler, Mao, Stalin, anybody else. Uh, but and nevertheless, I suppose all of the Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Mao might have also been th thrill seekers. I'm not sure. There is such a thing as a genetic thrill-seeking factor. Uh, there's a gene called DRD4. Um, and if you have a, a variant of it, I can't remember whether it's a longer version of this gene or a shorter version, it's one or the other, you have a stronger need for uh, excitement and, and, and thrills. Um, the amygdala is a part of the brain that uh, uh, shows alarm, uh, a strong emotion when we're in trouble. And the first thing it does is um, react and very quickly. Um, only later do we get to think about what we're doing, but the amygdala has some very quick automatic responses. Well, the person with the DRD4 gene, there's some kind of low reactivity involved in this. So uh, they, um, they uh, do not uh, experience as much excitement given the same stimulus that you and I would feel shocked or horrified or emotional about. The um, thrill seeker, person with the thrill seeker <coughs> gene, uh, does not feel that uh, same degree of emotional arousal, and therefore they need more. So they're looking for stronger stimuli that give them the kind of excitement that they want. Um, there was a study at the University of Delaware in the year 2000 that found that about 40% of the high thrill temperament is learned, and 60% is inherited. Um, Partly, and this is, uh, involves serotonin, which apparently inhibits the impulsive behavior. And uh, it's uh, in short supply in people with high-wire personalities. The Kennedy family, for example, is very famous for always having, getting into difficulty because they have this thrill-seeking gene and they go into dangerous situations. But people with the DRD4 anomaly um, tend to be interested in gambling or mountain climbing, adventure, thrills, <laughs> firefighting, military activities. They mostly say that they are more careful than other people. They double check their parachutes, for example, if they're going to go jump out of a plane. They're very careful, and they think this makes them safe. It's not too dangerous for them. I have a friend who uh, worked in Doctors Without Borders, and, uh, and when he's back in Canada, he worked in emergency rooms and until um, he could get his next assignment overseas. And that wasn't enough for him, so he would go mountain climbing on weekends or rock, rappelling down cliffs and so on because he clearly had this gene, he had, to, he had to do something to get more excitement in his life. Um, now, these are this tendency, not necessarily the gene part, but the behavior part, 
is uh, related to political values and personality. Uh, Dan Cahan, um, who teaches at the Yale Law School, compared people with hierarchical individualistic worldviews, and these are mostly conservatives politically, with egalitarian community-minded people who are mostly, of course, liberals, like that's good people. The former are resistant to belief in climate change uh, because it would lead to restraints on commerce, he says, and so they tend to deny the evidence. Whereas egalitarian liberals are likely to be suspicious of industry and very ready to believe that it's harming the environment. Well, how do you, um, how do you overcome uh, this discrepancy between them? Very different points of view. Well, he did an experiment. He asked people to read a scientific paper reporting that climate was changing faster than expected. Before reading it, he divided them into various groups. One group was asked to read an article urging work on geoengineering, that is, of course, a technological solution. Or else read an article calling for, now this is the other group. They could have been asked to work, read this thing on favoring geoengineering or an article uh, on regulatory solutions, that is, putting a high uh, carbon cap on emissions. And then there was a control group that read unrelated articles about uh, traffic lights or something. Um, and all three groups included both individualists and communitarians. Well, as expected, the individualists were always more likely to reject the scientific paper, the one saying that there's more climate change than we knew, or faster. However, if they had read the paper about geoengineering beforehand, they were more likely to accept the climate change paper. Conservatives apparently prefer to think about climate change as a technological problem rather than a regulatory problem. That is a useful bit of information if you're trying to, to deal with people changing their opinions, I think. I, I'm actually, I'm not a conservative at all, but I, I, think, I think of it as a uh, technological challenge, much more than a regulatory problem. Uh, so I guess maybe I belong in there with conservatives. You know. Now, the, uh, we move then from, from talking about people who have some pathological condition, and I don't know what you want to call it this day, pathological, it's different, uh, to talking about us normal folks who nevertheless have a range of problems about how to deal with um, risk, how we appreciate, how we recognize risk, how we, uh, how we make our decisions. And there's a number of, of pieces of research coming out of social psychology. Going back to the 1950s when Solomon Ash did his famous experiment uh, with uh, lines, and it's showing, um, he had seven in groups, in which he had seven Confederates, and it's people who were prompted to work with him, and one real subject. And they were asked, okay, here you have one line, and over here you have three other lines, one of which is like this one, the other two are longer, longer or shorter. Pick the line that matches this. Well, beforehand in a control group, where there's no pressure to conform, the error rate was only 1%. Everybody into this. You can see this clearly, which line matches this one. There were 18 trials, and the Confederates answered incorrectly in 12 of them. That is, they, the Confederates were told to pick the wrong, consistently pick the wrong one uh, in 12 of them. They had to pick the particular one, though, the longer or the shorter element. In the experimental group, 75% of the participants conformed at least once. That is. Other people would say it's A, it's A, it's A, it's A, and you get to the end, of course, it's, it's really B, but this poor guy has heard other people saying it's A, 
Well, it is China promises at the moment, you know, I'd say, I guess. Uh, and 75% and of the participants conformed that way at least once, but they did 18 trials. So there were about 25% of the people who never conformed, who always had their own perception, and then, you know, they just said what they saw. And so there was an overall conformity of 33%. Although the yielding, the person who yielded at the end was suspicious, he didn't have the nerve to say what he saw, which demonstrates terribly well the impact of social pressure or the desire to be considered normal. Um, and uh, so this, this goes on, and there's another guy named Sharif who did a study you put people in a dark room, I mean, absolutely black room. It was a pinpoint of light. And there's a phenomenon where if you see a pinpoint of light and you don't have anything, any, anything to engage it by, it looks eventually like it's moving to some extent. So he put people in a room and he asked them, was it moving or not, by how much, in which direction, and that sort of thing. And, it was random, you know, that people would see different things. Then he put him in a room where everybody was, was staged to, to give an answer, and they would, uh, or they'd have one, even one person who was very confident, who would say it's gone four inches to the left, and very, very clearly. And uh, they would, uh, everybody would agree. And the weird thing is, there would be sort of a buildup of culture. You could take this person out and put in some other people. And after, you know, people have all agreed. Let's move forward to the left, or whatever. Whatever it was that this first person said, they accept that. And they can go out and then you can replace everybody in the group. Gradually, one after another, and the group will maintain its conviction that this light moved four inches to the left. Uh, so the, the false ideas that we have that have come from who knows where, from nowhere. I mean, somebody just made it up. People can give us false ideas, and they have some sound so uh, convincing that we can go on maybe to the end of time until somebody kind of comes and turns the light on and we see the damn thing hasn't moved at all, you know? It's, it's that our capacity to be persuaded and to have a culture of misunderstanding that perpetuates itself is amazing uh, and, and, and horrifying to me. I think, when I think of all the evils that I, um, I do, I think I'm willing to hurt people's feelings, I'm willing to do nasty things in the name of standing up for what I see. Because to me, there's something so immoral about being willing to not say the truth about what I perceive that um, almost any other of character flaw, <laughs> I will. I would pre prefer that over um, capitulating to social pressure, and that's just my value system. Sorry, that's what I believe. It's not a good thing to do. Okay, so here we have. We move into what does this do when you apply this dynamic, this the group pressure phenomenon to decisions that people make involving real risks. Back in the 1970s, Irving Janus studied a number of political decisions that were made, international decisions that were made, uh, in which the decisions were really bad. And he looked at the dynamics of the group in which uh, that, those decisions had been reached. He studied the Bay of Pigs, and his first book studied the Bay of Pigs and compared it with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, as it happened, a lot of the same people were in both of the same things. They were Kennedy's cabinet and his advisors. 
So some of the same people were involved in both decisions, but they were, the process was quite different. Um, in the Bay of Kings, there were some critics who tried to come in and express their opinions that this was a bad, damned fool idea, they shouldn't try it. Um, Arthur Schlesinger did and William Fulbright. But they were shushed and they were not, you know, their uh, opinions were discounted to such an extent that in time they censored themselves, at least Fulbright did, I think, or one or the other. Thing. And uh, so what happens is that you get people together and they like each other and they make bad decisions because they don't want to disagree with each other. They don't want to challenge what the other person has said. So uh, Janice claimed that this thing called groupthink always happened in a group where people valued each other. They liked harmony. And um, a very cohesive group always abides by group rules. Now, in fact, later on, people have challenged that this is, or even he didn't think that a cohesive group was necessarily going to lead to groupthink or bad decisions. You could have a, a, a very cohesive group in which the group norm is give everybody's different point of view a chance to be heard, encourage dissent, encourage people to think of alternative strategies and so on. So if, if you have a cohesive group with that kind of value system, then you don't likely get groupthink. Anyway, until, until Genesis research, it had been thought that group cohesion, uh, cohesion was a good thing in terms of it would probably more often than not reach good decisions because groups could come to, a cohesive group could come to a consensus quicker and with lower cost of energy. The only trouble is, over time, this process can lead the group to being um, less able to think critically. So it's important, even if you have a good, smart group of people, and certainly Kennedy's cabinet is smart, um, you have to do things to try to offset the effects of groupthink or the possibility of groupthink. So various things can be done. You assign everybody the role of being a critical evaluator. From the beginning, let's all agree we're all going to find fault with each other's opinions. And so everybody's free to air their doubts and uh, objections. The leader shouldn't express an opinion when assigning a task to the group because they'll tend to conform to whatever he wants, so he shouldn't want to know what he's looking for. The instruction should be to look at all possible alternatives. And then maybe the group should invite experts in from outside to the meeting. And in fact, for every meeting, you should have a devil's advocate appointed whose specific task is to argue with everybody. And it should be a different person for each meeting rather than somebody getting the habit of doing that and so on. Well, Kennedy apparently, according to Janice, Kennedy did a lot of this during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And um, he set members to discuss their possible solutions and divided them up into subgroups so that they, they wouldn't have any group cohesion, but they'd have separate, but each subgroup maybe come up with a different point of view. And then when they got back together, you see that they didn't all agree. Um, and he absented himself deliberately from some of the meetings so as to avoid pressing his own opinion. Later on, people have, uh, researchers have decided that it really isn't necessary to have cohesiveness as a precondition for groupthink. You can get it for all kinds of, in all kinds of ways. They don't have to like each other. But group homogeneity and group insulation are factors. So when you have a group that are similar to each other, whether they like each other or not, they're more likely to come up with group think. And if they're insulated from outside pressures, again, more likely. So it's important to avoid that. Other people have studied various kinds of 
risk-taking decisions, Pearl Harbor. And this was a very clear case, because Washington had received word that the Japanese were massing for a, an attack. And they warned the officers in Pearl Harbor to be on the lookout, but their warnings were not taken seriously. There have been studies of the Vietnam War, of Watergate, and of the invasion of Iraq by uh, the US. Um, who should make decisions about risk? The experts or the people who are going to suffer from the bad decision, bad, bad outcome, the danger? It's kind of hard to say in that the public actually doesn't necessarily know enough. On the other hand, uh, the, the experts also have things at stake, and they aren't necessarily right either. It's much more democratic to say the public should have some kind of say about this. And um, apparently, the public can, even if it doesn't know the probabilities, it can recognize the catastrophic potential. Uh, you don't have to be too smart to be told that if a uh, nuclear reactor blows up, it's not good. <laughs> you know, it, it, the public understand, can understand such things if you let them have anything to say about it. The reality is that they don't always have anything to say about it. Uh, Charles Perrault uh, is a sociologist who wrote a book called Normal Accidents, and he was actually he was one who moved the study of risk-taking behavior or risk awareness behavior from psychology, which is what I've been talking about mostly, group dynamics and, and individual personality psychology, into studying it as a sociological project for, um, for the risk of organizations in terms of how organizations make decisions. And he claimed that in, uh, I think it was the Three Mile Island thing that he was involved with studying. Um, and he, he called normal risks, those normal accidents rather, those that result from the system itself, where the, the way you got the thing organized is such that you don't have the right kind of backup redundancies in order to catch a problem and, and so on. So sometimes the system itself inevitably, eventually, will lead to a catastrophe. And I think, as I pointed out, there were four such things in the case of, of the Three Mile Island event, four failures that normally wouldn't have been failures because one, if one broke down, the other one would have picked it up and solved it. But they all had to fall through that day. There's a woman named Lee Clark. And you know, it might be a man. The name Lee is very obscure, but Lee Clark, anyway, uh, wrote a paper that I thought was quite interesting called Explaining Choices Among Technological Risks. This is in 1988. I'm going to call it she. I don't know who it is. Uh, she, let's say, uh, said that it's not normal individuals who choose to accept the big risks. Yes, we decide whether to step up into the street in front of a truck or not. But there are so many other decisions that we don't make for ourselves. Even, for example, whether to wear seatbelts. There's a law. So after a while, you do, you do buckle up. Not by choice, necessarily, or that you think about it, but because you just obey the law. And um, advertising controls us in a thousand different ways. Um, including risks. Government subsidies to various um, kinds of uh, commodities that are um, may or may not be denied. Um, so the public has not been involved in nuclear decisions. There's evidence that early, uh, early on, 
the estimates about nuclear risks were based on the premise that domestic nuclear power was necessary because it would put us, it would work hand in glove with national defense. If we were going to have a nuclear weapons system, it would be convenient to also have nuclear power because that would produce the material we need. So this was apparently why we got nuclear reactors or a part of it at the beginning. And decision makers in the AEC, which is the American, American, what's it, Atomic Energy Commission, is it? Yeah. And the IAEC, and, and IAEE? IAEA. Huh? IAEA. IAEA, thank you. Uh, were uh, faced with uh, discrepant data about nuclear safety, but they'd already made decisions about what they were going to do, so they fudged it, apparently, to so that the predictions of future risk would confirm whatever course of action they'd already decided to take. Now, this is a, a big allegation, and I don't know, you know, I want the evidence on this. It's a terrible thing to say that that, that might have been how we got to where we are now. But it's a very important point to make. If it is true, we de definitely should know it. And probably we should put the guy on trial who put us in that situation. Uh, this Lee Clark uh, did a study of, uh, she actually did two studies, one of Pinto cars, the expl exploding Pinto, remember that? Mm -hmm. And um, a, a, uh, an event in Binghamton, New York, where some kind of big fire got going and it caused um, dioxin and PCBs and stuff to put be emitted inside a house so that the, everything, and even including it, locked file cabinets would be full of the soot from the stuff and it was impossible to get rid of it all. Um, so uh, the decision, uh, decisions about how these things get made, they're two rather, I think, rather different kinds of explanations. The Pinto car thing looks to me like the most despicable uh, from what, <laughs> what she reported. And some of this was based on uh, work by Mark Dowie back in the 70s. The, the uh, car, Ford car uh, industry was, uh, had fought, not just Ford, but the whole auto industry had already fought off attempts in the 1960s to regulate car makers. But, and so they came upon this thing where there was a problem with, um, what was the, the car tank, a fuel tank or something? It, it blew up, it, it, would, it would blow up, and now I don't remember what part of the animal it did, but it, it was uh, explosive and it would burn. And early on, or pretty early, um, the uh, Ford company figured out that uh, how much it was going to cost. And they figured, okay, $200,000 a person who, who will be killed, and given the cost of manufacturing Pintos in 19, between 1970 and 1977, um, the cost of lives saved and injuries prevented and undamaged property would be about $50 million. Well, they may had if they don't, if they just they figure out paying that, because their profits would be at least $136 million. So they'd be ahead if they just let that happen. Mm -hmm. So that's what they apparently chose to do. I mean, I'm kind of reading into what she wrote there, but I, I, I should look maybe at the, the original research by Mark Dowie. But uh, it apparently was shock of the public when it came out that, that, the, that they'd actually calculated, yeah, we'll have to pay $200,000 a piece for everybody who's killed. But people were really shocked by this. I don't blame anybody feeling that way. But this was a decision that was clearly made by the executives in the car company.
to go ahead and let this proceed, and we'll just pay for whatever happens. He, uh, apparently, Lee Iacocca, according to this writer, um, was interested in competing with Volkswagen, and so he wanted to hurry up and get this thing into production. He couldn't take the time to fix it. So that's why we went ahead. So both the Lee Clark and uh, Perot claim that when big corporations have been involved in making risky decisions, that often the power people are the ones who actually make the risk, take the risks. And there's a conscious decision to go ahead and, and do this. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes it's not a decision, but it's just confusion. And I think the case of this Binghamton, New York fire was one of those things. There were many different agencies, all that might have to come in and be involved, and nobody quite knew who was going to be responsible for doing what, and who was to decide whether you're going to call the janitors and tell them to start cleaning it up or not, which somebody did. It turns out it's a very bad decision because the janitors go in there and this is full of dioxin and it's poisonous and, and they shouldn't have been in there. So that kind of confusion about the organizational structure and how decisions should be made can also be a lethal situation and it doesn't necessarily uh, result from malice. I don't have any conclusions to reach from all this. These are just some general reflections of mine about how complicated it is to think about um, taking risks and about the subjects that we're going to be talking about for the rest of the series of, of, of lectures. We will be talking about risky business and um, I don't know that there's any little formula that and we can take home from this that's going to give us any leverage in making good decisions. Well, I, I, I know a certain amount about Cuban as a crisis theory, but my conversation. And when Kennedy divided his groups up, it almost didn't make any difference because everybody had the same mindset, which was from the Second World War, that appeasement is dreadful. And so they weren't really able to wrap their heads around mm -hmm the alternative solution. And the amazing thing about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we sort of, Kennedy may have had many faults in the Bay of Pigs, but that he and his brother and one other were able to do a sort of what if. I mean, he'd read the guns of August, and that's kind of a famous thing, and he said our assumptions could be wrong. And he was so vilified for being able to try to think of negotiation. You know, and in the end, it was only him. He was the only person who would have been willing in the end to even publicly acknowledge that they should take the missiles out of Turkey. And when in fact he didn't have to publicly acknowledge, he denied it and he said the Americans would never be able to cope with the idea that I'd make any kind of negotiation. He gave an article to the um, Saturday Evening Post where he blamed it on Adlai Stevenson and vilified Stevenson and said, I never would have negotiated, even though there is records to show it. And that's really because the whole country, in their view, couldn't have stood it. And it's really interesting because um, 25 years later, Schlesinger admitted that he excised anything from Robert Kennedy's diaries that acknowledged negotiation. So for someone like Schlesinger to do that, is amazing because it just shows how strongly he felt it. And then everyone thought if, if they'd ever told Lyndon Johnson that they had had a negotiation, Lyndon Johnson's a wheeler dealer. He might have been much more willing to negotiate about Vietnam, but he thought the only way to do it. I mean, Kennedy said, you know, we kicked ass and they gave in. That's the way. And I mean, for him to get Joseph also to change again what happened in the Saturday Evening Post article. And poor old Adley Stevenson was vilified for the rest of his life. But it's just, it's the difficulty of people being able to get outside the prevailing wisdom, which was so strong at the time, which was appeasement is weak. And Kennedy's father was seen as weak, and everyone said, you're weak. Kennedy, to everyone's amazement, was able to go around that and actually do the back channel negotiation. But then, as I say, when he did it. So the only success out of the whole thing came from Kennedy personally. Is that what you're saying? Well, and also Khrushchev. We have to give Khrushchev some credit too, because he, tr uh, those two men, actually, because he, and he was vilified the rest of his life, and, and 
you know, he, he has a, quite a few faults too, Khrushchev, but in this one, he really, he had that famous thing about we should not pull the knot of war, you know, which, which you have started, but we are finishing. He really knew and stood up to his people that he didn't want to go to war, and that he was vilified by that. You know, it, it doesn't bring anyone any glory in many ways to do the right thing. The guy who stopped World War Three and, uh, you know, what is his name? Arhipov, you know, the guy in the submarine who didn't release his nuclear weapons when he went back to the Soviet Union, everyone said, you should have started World War Three, and then he cut off his pension and he died in penury. So, you know, it's, it's quite amazing when anyone does take a step aside. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's so much more complicated than I think all these Articles say that you could decide this, or you could have this, you could have that, because the difficulty of thinking rationally about something where you've got a whole society saying appeasement is what is totally dreadful and horrible, and anyone who does it is a person who should be vilified, mm -hmm. it's lucky you do get a candidate Absolutely. and a couple of other people. And, and, and he, you know, he had a secret document that if Khrushchev hadn't accepted the first one. He was going to get something through the UN, through the Sandy Powers, you know, blah, blah. Uh, but that is truly secret. And, you know, he, when he didn't have to make it public, he denied it. That's it's interesting. Yeah. It's just interesting. One of the things about the Jensen's uh, research is that in terms of the group think process, we are not talking about individuals and individual uh, decision making here because uh, Jensen's whole work is based upon studying how the groups make risky decisions and how they move toward more riskiness than any individual within the group. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I think which is really, really helpful in his research is that he talks about dehumanizing the other, yeah. which is, I think, really a profound insight in terms of social psychological processes of group, group decision making. When you dehumanize the other, it is to a certain degree you give your own side, whatever side mm -hmm. that is, that ultimate moral uh, justification to do, in a way, whatever you want because you're representing the morality. Mm -hmm. Which is and what they did the human exactly. crisis because they felt a uh, exactly. hundred million deaths exactly. would be worth it. Because, you know, it, it exactly. is Exactly, it on itself. And then that kind of a dehumanizing the other, which is Jensen's words, I'm using by the way, mm -hmm. uh, also gives the part that is doing the dehumanization uh, to a certain degree, infallibility mm -hmm. on their own side. Mm -hmm. We cannot fail. Mm -hmm. I mean, we cannot absolutely fail because they are so bad, so uh, non-moral, immoral, so you know, backward and so mm -hmm. stupid. I don't know how to work against that. Though. Uh, it is really, really mm -hmm. interesting. The I think the riskiest positions are when both sides are locked into uh, this kind of a process. I mean, it is the riskiest possible outcome that I can think of when America thinks, shall we say, that they are the moral police of the whole wide world and they make always the good decisions and they are so powerful and the other ones are stupid and so on. And the other side, let's say Russia, or it could be Palestinians, or it could be Pakistanis, or it could be anybody else who think the same way, saying that we are the moral side, we, you know, know the truth, we are the good people. And then there is absolutely no way out of getting out of this situation. I, I really appreciate that you are bringing up Khrushchev position into, to a certain degree, de-entangling this as much as yeah. uh, Kennedy's. And it is absolutely uh, important and important. But that was actually probably why he had this, uh, the Amsterdam. That was a good yeah. part mm -hmm. of one. Yeah. 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 He had to go against his generals. He had to go against his generals, mm -hmm. but Kennedy we are talking was about able to lie. Right? find themselves in those kinds of situations. And 
it is really a miracle to de-escalate after, after a while, because it to a certain degree feeds well, on this. Think of how hard it is, because in a way Obama has tried to de-escalate a little bit. He's a little cooler, he step. I mean, we, again, you may not think everyone's perfect, but he has certainly much more stepped back and not had America, you know, in the forefront. And, and I mean, it's, it's lucky he got reelected. I mean, it's lucky he, the Mitt Romney trope, didn't win out, which is that he apologized, he's weak, he's pathetic, he doesn't think America is great, and so forth. I mean, it's a risky thing. I, you know, it's interesting. But if you then take as an ethical principle <clears throat> that's essential if we're ever going to make it through any of our problems, that you might be wrong, that, that nobody is infallible. That's what sticks in my, my craw as a Protestant with Catholic theology. The assumption that any one human being can be infallible. <laughs> Which and, is the thing and this is highly dangerous to think this, because then you are not open to questioning uh, the possible flaws in your reasoning. Yeah and the possible failure to take into account all the moral principles that human beings should when dealing with one another. Anna always laughs because I always do bring up, but I do think it's important that Kennedy did read The Guns of August and he gave it to every one of his uh, bases. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure nobody else read it because people don't read what people tell them to read. But that's what he did keep saying. Their assumptions were wrong, our yeah. assumptions could be wrong. And he was yeah. the only one to say it. That is what we owe to him. I mean, and it's interesting because he's a Catholic. Yeah, but that was interesting. It was he and then he convinced his brother. But th th there they were, you know, and it was lucky. And I don't know what good effects were going on with Khrushchev, but something, you know, or, well, his experience in the Ukraine and so forth. It was, you've got to get people who are able to see that, you know, yes, you're quite, that they may be wrong. And that is a very difficult thing for people to see without appearing to be weak. You know, for and, and Kennedy then gave up on that. He 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 denied he ever did it, and that that's been very detrimental to the next fifty years of American yeah. life. But well, that was just. I mean, think if only Lee, Lyndon Johnson had really thought that negotiation was a good idea. I mean, George Kennan, how who happy that said is. in the late forties, "In frail hands like ours, nuclear weapons cannot be trusted," and that is in essence what the problem is because there is no human being infallible, right. and the consequence of pressing the button can have such grotesque results. And people can't really think of that. I mean, it was clear that, you know, although everyone should be thinking of a billion starving and, you know, the winter and all these poor countries will be not able to grow anything, I mean, people can't think that way. They but what they could think is, and, and that's where, where Christian peacemaker teams have come down and, and other groups, they could think, what gives you the right to kill another person? Oh, we, that's what we hope that they will think, that would be, yeah, that is the hope. <laughs> you know, I think, I had a lot of respect for Khrushchev, yeah. even then, and, yes. you know, later, of course, he actually got sacked, largely because of this. Oh, yeah. I, uh, he instigated the back. Kennedy was open, but he instigated the back channel. Uh -huh. That's interesting. Yeah. It's your spot. It's your KGB spot. <coughs> Walter Dorn is going to talk about a Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks. Right. You're obviously on top of it. I haven't read this. Well, stuff. Walter's research, I, I, I've read Walter's stuff, but I'm not on top of it either because right? I didn't take it that seriously. But he has other views in person. You, you so that'll be interesting. Yes. Yes. Well. <coughs> yes. 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 You know what his views are? I don't know what no, his views are. No, no. Walter's very interesting. But, yeah. It'll be interesting talk. I'd be delighted to come. Yes, yeah. I remember Chris and Jones. And I enjoyed your talk too, by the way, even though it was too. It's all the script. When Chris Jones, you know, you said that he was he able to see that he was that he was capable of making a mistake. Right. I remember something, somebody in a public meeting challenged him because he had <coughs> he had uh, told uh, in in this party congress he had told the evils that Stalin had done mm -hmm. and and of course
course, then somebody at this public meeting said, well, you were there. And you did quite a few of them yourself. Not only that, but you, you, you listened to him doing these things, and, and he told you to do this, and he told everybody to do that, and, and you didn't object then. How come you're doing it now? And, and he, he, he wasn't clear who said this. He said, 